Welcome back to another Food for the Soul. Today is May 5th, 2022. Let us open in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you for bringing us together again today. We ask that you just send your Holy Spirit down upon us and continue to guide us and direct us as we grow in our knowledge of the saints and our knowledge of the faith. We ask that you just uh, continue to watch over all peoples, all of our families and friends. We also pray for peace in Ukraine as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just a reminder, you can text in any questions to 408-684-7711. For the saints of the day today, I found there were, there were three saints that were a little bit more obscure that had some more information about them. Um, the first one is St. Irene of Leachy. Uh, she was the daughter of a wealthy pagan, and her father actually considered her so beautiful that he kept her locked in a tower under a guard. Um, but she, in her life, she received instruction on the Christian faith directly from the Holy Spirit and was later baptized by St. Timothy. She, uh, in her life, she refused to worship to idols. And based uh, on this refusal to accept her father's paganism, he planned to have her tied to a horse and, and uh, drugged to death. But miraculously, she was unharmed. Um, the horse did retaliate and actually bit her father, and he died from this wound. Although Irene, you know, ha having this uh, great charity, she prayed for her father to be, to be brought back to life, and his life was restored. And after this incident, her father did convert to Christianity, and they both worked as evangelists to help convert thousands of pagans. Eventually, though, the anti-Christian governor, Ampelio, um, he, this angered him, and he captured, imprisoned, and tortured Irene. And when she refused to renounce the faith, she was beheaded. So she, she's a, a martyr. There have been churches dedicated to her in Constantinople since the 5th century. The second uh, saint of the day is actually a, a blessed, blessed Caterina Cittadini. Uh, she was born in September 1801 in Bergamo, Italy. Her mother died when she was seven, and her father ended up abandoning her and her younger sister. But both sisters were accepted and grew up at the orphanage of the uh, convent in Bergamo. And it was there that she learned to have a strong faith and devotion to both our Blessed Mother and St. Jerome Emilani. The sisters ended up leaving the orphanage in 1823 to live with their cousins who were both priests in Cal Calizio, Italy. Caterini ended up becoming a teacher at a girls' public school. And later, the, both sisters felt a call to the religious life, and their spiritual director recommended they stay in the town of Somaxia, and uh, they started a new congregation in this area. They opened a boarding school for girls, and Caterini taught religion. She helped to manage the school, and she instituted an oratory style of, ed of education for the girls. So there was a kind of a religious life uh, style to the schedule. Eventually, uh, word of the success of this school uh, spread and attracted more students, and both sisters opened up two more schools. Now, her sister uh, directed these schools until her sudden death in 1840. But then, uh, and then Caterina's cousin, who was a priest, Father Antonio, he also died the following year. Um, and and the, the, with this succession of tragedies, you know, this really affected Caterina, and she fell ill herself, almost dying, but uh, she was cured through the intercession of St. Jerome. 
Katerini eventually quit her position in teaching, and she uh, worked on managing the schools, caring for orphans in the town, and she helped guide companions uh, who had joined her with this work. They eventually wrote a, a rule of life for their group that was very similar to that of religious orders. She also obtained permission to build a private oratory to keep the Blessed Sacrament at her boarding school, and she uh, applied for approval of her new religious uh, family. And, but it wasn't until six months after her death in December of 1857 that the Bishop of Bergamo gave approval of the order, which is named the Ursuline Sisters, um, and they were achieved papal recognition in July of 1927. The order continues to work today to help teach and care for the abandoned. Then the third saint is Saint Nunzio of Sopruzio. He was born in April 1817 in Abruzzi, Italy. His father died when he was only three years old, followed by the death of his sister. So he went to live with a stepfather who treated uh, Nunzio as a burden. He didn't see him as someone he wanted around. And um, Nunzio received, ended up receiving his basic education at a school um, that was run by a priest. And th through this education and through attending mass, he started learning more about the saints and uh, using the saints to guide his life. His uncle had him working as an apprentice blacksmith, um, but he, he was very neglectful and abusive towards him. And this lifestyle eventually led him to uh, collapse with fever, and he had a, an untreated injury on his leg. Um, he was hosp hospitalized in Naples, Italy. And, but upon returning home due to his condition, people would, were very wary of him. They would stay away from him. So what, he would end up sitting in a stream to help cl uh, clean the wound in his leg, and he'd be praying the rosary at the same time. Now, he had another uncle on his father's side, Francesco, who was a soldier. And through this uncle, uh, Nunzio became friends with a Colonel Felice Watchinger, who became a surrogate father and paid for his medical care. Throughout his life, Nunzio went through uh, various times of improvement and setbacks with his injuries, but he ended up, uh, before he died at age of 19, he was known by all that knew him to be gentle, chaste, patient, and pious in a time when such qualities were very rare. He was canonized in October of 2018 by Pope Francis, and the miracle attributed uh, to him for his canonization involved the healing of a young man who had been injured in a motorcycle accident, and this young man went to a coma and was not expected to come out of a vegetative state. But when a relic of Blessed Nunzio was placed in the patient's room, after a week of prayers, he woke from the coma and his health was restored. Uh, Nunzio is the patron saint of workers. Moving on to our catechetical topic, um, I was going to tie this into a request I had to talk a little bit about the movie Father Stew. So I wanted to give kind of a quick overview of that movie um, by Mark Wahlberg, and then go into the topic of the Catholic view of suffering. Um, and then I also found an interest, interesting article that talked about some of the aspects of the real Father Stuart Long and his life, so kind of comparing how well the movie reflected on Father Stuart's life. Now, the movie Father Stu, which is out in theaters still right now, uh, stars Mark Wahlberg as Father Stuart Long. It also features Mel Gibson, as Stuart's father, Bill Long, and Teresa Ruiz as Carmen, which was Stuart's initial love interest in the movie. Now, Mark Wahlberg, he, he himself is Catholic, and he actually donated millions of his own money to help in the production of this movie. But uh, Father Stuart, Father Stu, was a former boxer who became Catholic in order to date his, his love interest, this Catholic woman. But then he eventually felt the call to the priesthood and the movie follows his life um, from his life before his conversion through that t his time in seminary, and then also how he learned to deal with a muscular disease that led to an early death. The movie is rated R for language, which is very coarse in the first half of the movie. And 
some of my thoughts on the movie, and I'd gone to see it uh, this past week, um, some aspects of the way sacraments were portrayed were not entirely accurate, but overall I found it to be a story of someone who was working to find his fulfillment in his calling, but then learning how to face suffering with courage. And it, I think this movie really speaks to our culture, one, about the, the need we have for a relationship with God, and secondly, how to best respond to suffering. Because in the movie, it shows how Father Stu, even as his disease progressed, he continued to minister to people, um, even when he was in, in the nursing home, and the effect that had on the number of people that came to him uh, for counseling, for confession. So overall, I think the movie was, it was very uh, well done, um, and I, I would recommend going to see it. And kind of tying into this, uh, talking a little bit about the Catholic view on suffering. Um, from the Catholic perspective, you know, uh, we have some ways of looking at suffering that's different than, than the rest of the world. A lot, of, a lot of the times people will look at suffering and not understand uh, anything about it or, or the reasons behind it or you know, how it can be useful at all. And we have to remember that, from, from my perspective, suffering is a part of everyone's life. Um, it's part of every person's life since the, the fall and since original sin. And suffering could be anything from physical to psychological or spiritual or social suffering. But we have to remember that um, God doesn't cause this, but he permits suffering in our life. And we can look at, okay, what are some, some things that uh, good that comes about from it? Because we know that God can bring good from any evil that comes into our life. So if God's permitting sufferings or permitting a certain specific suffering in our life, what's some good that can come out of it? And uh, one way we can start to see this good is kind of looking at, it from a, looking at the suffering from a different perspective. Um, one perspective to consider is how it helps bring about a greater dependence on God. Um, we recognize that we are not the ones in control and that we, we rely on Him. It helps us to turn towards Him more in prayer and to turn towards him in trust, you know, knowing that we may not have all the answers, or we may not know when the suffering will end, but know that he can help sustain us through it. Another way we can have a, a Catholic perspective on suffering is that we can look at our suffering as being possibly redemptive. If we offer what we're suffering in union with the suffering of Jesus on the cross, and we can do this for various intentions, so we can do it for uh, someone's conversion, where we could offer up our suffering for the salvation of souls, or for other intentions we have, so we can turn our suffering into a type of prayer united with Christ's suffering on the cross. And we see evidence for this in Colossians 1.24, where St. Paul says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of, the, sake of his body, that is, the church. So we see how, you know, even in our day, we can, the, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, while it was in history, spans throughout time. We can unite ourselves to that suffering as part of the body of Christ. And we can help um, offer our sufferings to the Father for various intentions. And there can be times in our lives where there may seem like, you know, there, we don't understand um, how we can offer up the suffering in a way that's redemptive, or we may not understand how can it help, you know, I, I'm already having dependence on God, I'm already, already praying to God, why am I still suffering? And sometimes when it seems like there's no reason behind it, we have to remember that there is some good that God will be able to bring out of it. And sometimes we may not even be able to see that good until we're in heaven. But we have to trust that with every suffering that is in our life, um, there is good that can come out of it, and, and that good that can come out of it, God will bring that good out of it. And in thinking about this topic, there were some, um, some books that I remember having read that kind of give us some reflections on the topic of suffering. The first one was um, a book entitled Littlest Suffering Souls, Children Whose Short Lives Point Us to Christ by Austin Ruse. And in this book, it's a story of six different children, and while they died young from, from different afflictions, they were able to teach the adults in their lives uh, various virtues, such as 
uh, the practice of self-sacrifice, self-forgetfulness, patience, and unconditional love. And a lot of the common lessons also included reflecting on the importance of the Eucharist, the importance of daily Mass, the Rosary, um, as, as well as offering our suffering with Christ for others. And I remember having read this book and just being very impressed by the... Um, being very impressed by the uh, just some of the insights that these children had on the aspect of suffering. Another book I'd heard, uh, read, I haven't read this one, but I've heard about it before. It was uh, Victor Frankl, uh, his book, Man's Search for Meaning. And he, he talks about some of the experiences in the uh, Nazi, Nazi concentration camps. And he notes how different prisoners would re, re, uh, respond differently. Some of them, even though they were all in the same circumstances, would fall into despair. But others would find reasons for joy, even in spite of their circumstances. And the difference that he, he found in his book was that you know, they, the prisoners that were finding joy had a reason to live. They focused on the good beyond their current circumstances. Um, and, and those who did not have a reason to live or a desire to live you know, would fall into despair. So I think just remembering that um, with, even though God may, may commit any kind of suffering in our life, it is something that always helps us grow closer to Him in one way or another, either through a greater dependence on Him or through offering up our suffering as a prayer, or even as a reminder that this life isn't the, uh, the end all be all, that we're ultimately called back to union with him at the end of our lives. And that um, just remembering these perspectives can help change the way we respond to suffering or the way we look at suffering. And that's one thing like with the, the movie Father Stew, it kind of reflected on a little bit. And there were some, uh, in the Catholic website, uh, Atalia, Atalia, they featured 14 facts about the real life Father Stuart Long. And one of those that I found, uh, I re found impressive was his response to, the, to his disease, where it was something where he was slowly losing the use of his muscles. And he said that it was, he, uh, quote, probably one of the best things that have ever happened to me. And he said the reasons behind this was because he states it helped teach him some humility, which he had lacked earlier in his life. But it also brought him closer to his father, who was helping him take care of him. Um, and Father Stu said, he, through suffering and depending on others, we're forced to get closer to God, which prepares us for moving on to the next life. And then some of the other interesting facts uh, about the real life Father Stuart Long is um, in the movie it only, only indicates he had a younger brother who had passed away at a young age, but in real life he also has a little sister, Amy, and she really uh, looked up to her older brother. And um, while she states while he appeared to be a very rough you know, guy with, with his boxing career and, and everything, he was really a very kind human being who had a deep love for all people that he met. Um, one, another interesting fact about the real life of Father Stewart is that uh, he actually was attending Mass before he became Catholic. Uh, he attended Carroll College in Montana, and at that college, the football coach uh, made attending Mass a requirement before each game. So he had some exposure to, to, the, um, to the Mass. He had some familiarity with it before his conversion. Um, in the movie, he actually portrays um, Stewart as the one who chose to go out to California to pursue an acting career. That was actually his, his uh, mother's suggestion that, that led to that. Um, and then also in the movie, it showed his conversion or his, his desire to uh, join the priesthood, feeling this call to the priesthood after the motorcycle accident. But in real life, he states that it was at the moment of his baptism that he knew he was called to be a priest. 
And he, uh, in the movie, it shows him, once he feels this call, he kind of runs to seminary right away and tries to apply you know, within, within that same day or so. But uh, in real life, he said he took seven years to really pray about it and discern what he, he felt this call was before he entered the seminary. And he, uh, he actually went to visit Lourdes at one point for seeking healing for his disease. And even though he didn't receive a physical healing, um, after he visited, he had a, a great sense of peace that was not there in his heart before, before visiting the shrine at Lourdes. And then in the movie, um, his father, played by Mel Gibson, is depicted as kind of an absentee father. But in real life, while his father did work away from home, he had a very uh, warm relationship with his family at home. And uh, his dad stated about the movie, he, I don't think it matters how I was portrayed. The film is about Father Stu. He stated people should come away from the movie with a message, have faith, hang in there, and endure. And uh, another interesting fact from the article is stating that uh, with, uh, the real Father Stu, he had this wheelchair and on the back of it. He would have uh, some magnets of his favorite saints, including Joan of Arc, Maximilian Colby, and Padre Pio. And also, just as kind of a sign of his humor, he also had a magnet of Bigfoot, just to be kind of silly. So he had this, um, you know, his, his humor made him very relatable to people. And a lot of times in his uh, homilies or in his preaching and counseling, he would take examples from the movies to help just people have a better grasp on topics to help them connect with what, uh, what he was saying. And then uh, finally, his, you know, his perception on life and death was ultimately helping us to remember to make peace with God so we can live in, a, in this place of life, happiness, and peace as we prepare for entry into eternal life. Just a reminder, if uh, anyone has any questions, they can text 408-684-7711. Moving on to uh, the news portion. With the uh, news in the diocese, Our Lady of Good Hope Church in Miamisburg will be hosting a Rise and Walk uh, Eastertide healing service on Saturday, May 14th at 6.30 p.m. For more information on this opportunity, uh, you can see the bulletin. Emmanuel Evangelization Commission, um, they're hosting one more workshop on evangelization. Uh, the focus of this series has been Reach Your Fallen Away Family. And uh, the workshop focuses on these foundations and principles of evangelization. The last session is May 16th at 7 p.m. Um, and they are being held in the Emmanuel School Building at 149 Franklin Street. Um, NAIM, which is a ministry for widowed Catholics, will be detailing upcoming social and worship activities at their June meeting, uh, or for June at their meeting on Monday, May the 9th. Um, and that meeting is going to be held at 7 p.m. at the St. Henry Parish Activity Center on Springboro Pike. There's more information on that also in the bulletin. Incarnation Respect Life Ministry will be hosting uh, Abortion Undercover, a panel discussion on Thursday, May 12th in room 104 of the Parish Center at 7 p.m. Uh, with this panel discussion, they're going to be talking about two pills that are used to induce abortion that are growing in popularity. Uh, the panel of experts includes a pharmacist, a physician, and the director of Dayton Right to Life. Uh, there's more information on this panel discussion in the bulletin. Presentation Ministries, they're going to be hosting a retreat to renew and revitalize your faith entitled Basic Training, Solid Food for the Disciples of Christ. And this retreat is going to be held May 13th through the 15th. It's going to begin at 7 p.m. that Friday and end at noon on Sunday. And it's held at Our Lady of Guadalupe Discipleship Center, 5701 Lawshe Road in Peebles, Ohio. There's information on how to register at presentationministries.com. As far as the parish news, um, the Reading Our Hearts for Transition, 
the third session. Uh, we had a session this morning at 9 a.m. in person. There's also going to be another one at 7 p.m. this evening uh, here in Friendship Hall. So this uh, third and final stage is going to be exploring strategies and an understanding of how we can become missionary disciples in our new parish family. The Knights of Columbus still have some begged mulch available uh, for pickup. Uh, there's uh, information on who to contact to uh, purchase one of those extra bags of mulch. This Saturday, May 7th, at the 5 p.m. Mass, the Confirmandi will be completing their initiation into the Catholic Church and receiving the Sacrament of Confirmation. Uh, Father Steve Angie will be presiding as a Chancellor here. Um, Respect Life Committee is going to be selling uh, roses and incarnations on Mother Day's weekend as a way to support Dayton Right to Life. Um, you don't necessarily have to purchase a flower, but you can pick up a baby bottle and fill it with spare change, cash, or checks made out to Elizabeth New Life Center. And you can return those by Father's Day, June 19th. The filled bottles will be helping uh, support Elizabeth New Life Center, which works towards save, uh, helping the pro-life cause, helping to save the lives of innocent babies. On May 8th, after the 11 a.m. Mass in the All Saints Room, um, we'll be holding a farewell reception for Marty McLean. He's going to be uh, leaving after 12 and a half years of serving St. Francis as the coordinator of Senior High Youth Ministry. Um, all are invited to come to this and wish him well as he prepares to move on to the next stage of his life. He'll be moving down to Florida to spend uh, time with family down there. Parishioner Marilyn Balmer, who's a biologist and native plant enthusiast, um, she'll be giving a tour of the St. Francis uh, Native Garden on Sunday, May 15th, after the 8.30 a.m. Mass. The Native Garden features over 45 varieties of flowers, trees, and shrubs native to Ohio. Plans are currently underway for a volunteer and ministry appreciation dinner on Saturday, May 14th. It's going to be held from 6 to 8.30 p.m. And uh, you can register um, at tiny.cc forward slash fellowship dash picnic. A new parishioner meet and greet is going to be held Sunday, May 15th, following the 11 a.m. Mass. Uh, you can come out and meet with those new parishioners who have joined the parish within the last four months. Uh, Jacob Lindell, who was the seminarian intern here last year, he will be uh, receiving his ordination to the priesthood at the May 21st Mass at the cathedral. That's going to be at 11 a.m. at the Basilica, Cathedral Basilica of St. Peter's and Chains on West 8th Street in Cincinnati. Uh, there's information on his vocation story in the Catholic Telegraph at catholictelegraph.com forward slash category forward slash vocations. Also, the men's club, they're going to be hosting a Euchre party on Saturday, May 21st from 7 to 10 p.m. in Friendship Hall. Um, so there's more information on that also in the bulletin. As far as uh, recommendations for uh, Catholic sites, Catholic activities, um, one of the Catholic pilgrimage sites I learned about is called Servants of Mary Center for Peace. It's up in Windsor, Ohio, uh, 40 miles east of Cleveland. And this site uh, was began in 1987 when a, a deacon and his wife purchased a 120-year-old farm in the Windsor. And they were originally planning to use it as a youth camp, but they lost the farm in 1990, and, but later were able to repurchase it in 92. And what uh, this deacon Ed and his wife Pat did is they uh, used the 50-acre farm. They, erected a 50-foot statue of Our Lady of Guadalupe, which is covered with over 450,000 mosaic tiles. And then in front of this statue, there's a large lake called the Lake of Hope, and it's surrounded by a very large illuminated rosary. So you've got these lighted bulbs to, to form the rosary around the lake. The property also includes a chapel for the Holy Innocents called the Holy Innocents Chapel. And that features a memorial for all children who have died young. 
Um, for more information on this site up there, uh, you can visit servantsofmary.org. Um, looks like we've come to the end of our time here today. So thank you for joining me. And we'll go ahead and close in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you for just uh, bringing us together again to learn a little bit more about the saints, as well as to reflect on uh, just the topic of the Catholic understanding of suffering, as well as learning a little bit more about the life of Father Stuart Long and that, that movie, uh, Father Stu. We ask that you please just watch over us as we go forth from here. We ask that your blessed mother, your blessed mother wraps us in her mantle of protection and keeps us safe um, until we can all meet again. As we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for joining me today.